So I've been working on serrated tussock for what, a decade now, on and off, about three years less than, than Warwick um, has been working on serrated tussock. Um, and I now uh, work on looking at what the environmental impacts of uh, agricultural production systems are. Um, it's a relatively new modelling strategy and, and don't freak out that it's modelling. Um, and really what, as Warwick said, you know, we're, we're doing a pilot project at the moment. What Warwick has done and then with me picking up that and starting to look at the environmental impacts hasn't been done before anywhere, uh, so it's very new. Um, it may not look like there's a lot of work in there, but there's been, you know, a hell of a lot of work in here. Um, and I'm going to pull it, try and pull it all together at the end. You know, you guys might be looking at the graphs that I'm putting up and whatnot. You know, so I'll try and pull some relevance together. But I guess the point that I want to make is that the, the stuff that I'm doing, you know, we're, we're trying to bring it down to more of a farm scale but it's actually designed more for, for regional, you know, national, global scale stuff. So I'll try and pull it all in together towards the end. Um, now, this is, uh, I mean, if you didn't know what it was, you'd probably think that was actually quite pretty, but, you know, that's kind of where we don't want to end up um, with serrated tussock. Uh, <clears throat> righto, so, the purpose of what I've done was to essentially say, you know, and, and it is a pilot study to say, okay, if we've got a block that, or a farm with native pastures uh, that has no serrated tussock and then serrated tussock invades, that's a change to the system and what are the environmental impacts of that change occurring? So that has essentially been what the, the question or how I've framed the question. And as Warwick said, um, you know, the, the, the base system or the reference system is no serrated tussock and then looking at boom spraying your infestation, spot spraying, spot and boom spraying or no control. And so saying, well, we, if, if people take either of these options on farm, what are the environmental impacts of those? And by the way, if you have questions, jump in, ask questions as we go kind of thing. Don't, don't sit there and wait. <clears throat> so I'm going to, um, I'm going to explain uh, what I've done and how I've done it. So the whiz bang name for it is life cycle assessment. So all that means is that um, you're looking at a product, in this case it's wool, is, is what we've, oh, what do I do? Um, at this, in this case it's wool and we're looking at the environmental impact of the life cycle, but um, Okay, so in this instance, it's one kilogram of greasy 19 micron wool. Now, life cycle assessment normally looks at disposal as well, but we look at cradle to farm gate. Once any product leaves the farm, the producer has got no control at all over what happens to it. So we don't include that. You know, we're, we're interested in the, in the ag production side of things. And what cradle means is that, you know, we take into account the impact of things like um, a tractor that's used in a system. That's just an example. So it's looking at the very start of the production of every single thing through to wool leaving the, uh, leaving the farm. So from essentially what I did was I, I used inputs um, from the work that Warwick did. So that included wheat as a, uh, as a supplement. Um, the herbicide, production, transport of herbicide, fuel used in a tractor, emissions from animals, so that's primarily methane from, from rumination as well as nitrous oxide from, um, from manure deposition. Um, looked at how much mutton and wool was produced under each scenario, and these are all Ausfarm outputs from Warwick's validated, um, validated Ausfarm model. So I'm just going to try here and explain this whole cradle to farm gate thing. So if we have inputs, so you know, in this instance an input is fuel, tractor fuel, so we include the manufacturer of that tractor fuel. <coughs> that has to get transported to farm, so then we include the, the impact of the transport to farm. Then all these things go into the production of wool in the sheep, 
the sheep in, in that process for producing wool give off things like methane and nitrous oxide. Don't worry about that middle step. And then we end up with what we call impact categories. And so there's multiple impact categories that you can look at. Um, climate change, which is greenhouse gases, eutrophication, which is release of nutrients into water, which will cause algal blooms, things like that. Um, fo oil use, fossil fuel use, but also land use. How much land does it take to actually produce this? And so if you look at something like land use, I mean, there's going to be more and more pressure as the world's population increases, there's going to be more and more pressure on the land that we've got. So we really want to make sure that we're not having a negative impact on land use and we're going out there and you know, having negative effects on, on other parts of the country, other parts of the globe. <coughs> um, so life cycle assessment, as, I'm indica as I said uh, first up, it, it's more suited to regional kind of things and, and looking at global impacts and all the rest of it. It's more suited to that. But we're actually now saying, well, let's, let's look, at this at a, look at this at a farm scale and then see if we can actually tie the economics of a, of a whole farm system with the environmental impact of a whole farm system. And so it just aids in that decision making process. Um, the, the main thing here is Warwick presented to a wetter and a drier um, climate, forward climate projections. I've only looked at the, the worst case scenario, which is the drier climate. It take, it, you know, I didn't have time essentially to do the, the wetter one. Um, and importantly, we're looking at that, the impacts of a change to a system. And they might, in this instance, it's stocking rate, um, control method, but also pasture perenniality. And it's all re relative to what we've called the reference system, which is the system without any serrated tussock. So what happens after that invasion and then we start making decisions about control. Um, Okay, and so the impacts, of, I'm not going to present all of these, but greenhouse gas emissions is a key one, how much land, chemical effects is one that I would really like to do, but I can't do. So what I'm really interested in looking at is saying, okay, if you're using, if you're boom spraying fluoropropanate, um, as opposed to spot spraying, are you putting a bucket load more chemicals into the environment that's having a negative, negative impact on the environment? Um, okay, so now, when we do this modelling, there are economic considerations, okay? Um, and really, this is when I'm talking about, you know, these global impacts and all the rest of it. Wool and mutton's a global market, you know? 95 or 96% of our mutton heads overseas, so it's a global market. And what we do is when, if, if a system, if you change a system, and that means you're producing, for example, less mutton, well, then we have to take that into account somewhere. And the easiest way to say that is just because we stop growing mutton, we being a region or whatever, doesn't mean that people want to stop eating it. Doesn't mean that the, the, the whole supply demand thing is going to change. All it means is they're going to put pressure on other places to actually keep supplying the mutton or the lamb or you know, whatever it'll be replaced with. So you, we try and take into account those kind of supply chain effects. Now this, and it, and it affects the outcomes. So, <clears throat> this is a graph, and in this instance I've chosen to use um, tonnes of carbon dioxide emitted per kilogram of wool. So everything that we're doing here, we're interested on what's the environmental impact of a, a kilogram of wool. Everything's on a base level here. So we use that as a uniform thing so that we can then look at trade-offs and whatnot. Now if we look at this, we go, okay, um, the 4DSE system, which is the blue line, actually emits more carbon dioxide, or carbon dioxide equivalents, than the 6DSE system. And it all goes up and all the rest of it. When we take into account the economic considerations, it changes the way we look at everything. And suddenly the, the, world, you know, the, the world changes. So this is the 6DSE system, it's on zero. It doesn't mean that there's no impact. It doesn't mean that it's giving out no carbon dioxide in the system. That's the reference system. So all we're really interested in is once you change it to 4DSE, what's the long-term impact of that change? And so after 30 years, I, I cut it off at 30 years, after 30 years, that's the impact that, that making that change to the system would have. So when we, so that, that's, um, that's greenhouse gas emissions. Now we um, 
can look at the land required to produce wool. So you can see here that over 30 years in the 4DSC, you actually need less land to produce a kilo of wool. So even though you might be putting out more greenhouse gas emissions, you're actually having a, a benefit on the amount of land you require to produce that product. So essentially, you can produce more wool per unit or unit area if you reduce your stocking rate. And I'll come to why this is here. And so the other one that I put up was how much oil would be required to produce a kilogram of wool. Now, once again, you know, if you change the system, you end up after 30 years re requiring less oil to actually produce a kilogram of wool. The reason for that is because that six DSE system has a lot more wheat going into it. You need to supplement the six DSE, you've got a higher stocking rate, so you need to give it more wheat, or you need it. You need to feed the sheep more wheat, and so that does a couple of things. One, you need more land because suddenly you're, 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 you're cropping areas out to get the wheat. Two, you need more oil. You know, there's fertiliser that goes in there, you've got your tractor, all the rest of it, but the reason that you're having a, a, a positive greenhouse gas effect is because um, wheat is a, is a better food, basically. So they, they don't put out as much um, greenhouse gases and all the rest of it. So it's a more efficient system um, that you get when you put, when you include the wheat. So the key points here are that, you know, it's, it's complex. It's probably more complex than it needs to be, but that's the framework that people have you know, implemented up until now. Um, focusing on one impact, if you're using this, may actually result in unintended consequences. So it's all about trade-offs. So, you know, what's more important? What are you actually going to do? Do you want to tar does it matter if um, you reduce your land use, but then you start putting out more greenhouse gases? So it's weighing all these things up. So it allows you to actually consider these trade-offs. And then the drivers of the impacts aren't always obvious. You know, as I said, in this instance, it's needing that wheat as a supplement that's actually driving the environmental impact of um, producing a kilogram of wool. So it's, yeah, it can be, uh, it can be a bit puzzling at times. Now, ah, oh, right, so this photo look, probably looks very similar. If you remember, um, and I, I'm gonna turn this into a, into a guessing game, Warwick put up a very, very similar photo. Do people remember? Yep, okay, so Warwick put up a very, very similar photo. I didn't actually know, th this is where Warwick and I did our field research. And I didn't actually know he had a photo very similar to this until this morning when he said, hey, I've put up a very similar photo. Now, you can see here, fence line comparison, all the rest of it, that's fantastic. You've got some dead serrated tussock here because they've put a plane over it with flupropanate, two litres per hectare. And down here, all this yellow stuff, that's all serrated tussock that's reinvaded. Who wants to have a guess? at how long after spraying that photo was taken. So you've got residual effects of flupropanate, which is meant to reduce invasion and all the rest of it. How long after the plane went over it was that photo taken? Somebody give me a number. Two years? Three years? Cold, warmer? Who said it? That is 18 months. So if somebody comes in to sell you flupropanate and say they're going to put a plane over your place and you have got Danthonia and Wallaby grass, which is what was predominantly in here, and they're going to say you're going to get residual control for three years, tell them to jam it. Because when you get the rain, and I'm pretty confident what Warwick said is, you know, I'm, I'm on that one as well. When you get the rain in a lot of country and it leaches through the soil, you don't get residual, you know? It literally was about six or seven months. The first plant started germinating before the adult plants died, you know, because it had such an, it just nailed the microlina and the wallaby grass. Now, <clears throat> um, there has been claims made that using granulated flupropanate will avoid that. Um, I don't, think that that's going to be right and there's one site where they did it where they're quite unhappy with the, the outcomes of the granulated flupropanate. I'm not saying yes or no, but I, I know I, you know, like I took this photo because they sprayed it just before I started using it as a field site and um, I'd heard about, you know, this was my introduction to Tussie and I'd heard about the residual effect and all the rest of it and then I was just gobsmacked at the rate that it reinvaded. You know, it was just phenomenal. 
10. Right, I'm getting, I'm getting hauled across the coals here, people. Um, okay, so we'll look at control strategies here. So in this, I'm going to look at um, greenhouse gases and land use, and I won't spend too much time. So what's the impact? This is at 4 dC per hectare. What's the impact of doing no control? I didn't even bother doing, putting that entire line in because these you can't even see these. But the main thing is you can see here is that compared to um, your no serrated tussock, these all start dipping down. It's the same thing. They've got less feed, so they're getting more wheat, and that is giving what appears to be uh, an improvement in greenhouse gas emissions. And then if you look at land use, once again, you know, no control just goes through the roof, and there really isn't much difference between these guys down here. If we do it with six DSE, suddenly the dynamics are changing. I mean, look at this. I, I, I can't even remember where the, the no control ended. <clears throat> but suddenly, you know, it's, it's not looking, um, or there, there's a greater uh, difference between the, the no serrated tussock and then that. And I don't know what's, I can't tell you what's driving that difference. Once again, if we look, look at land use at 6 DSE, no control's going through the roof. And then, you know, these are almost pretty much the same, but boom spraying, um, you know, it's going to take a little bit more land to, to, to produce a kilo of wool. Right, so the key point from this, the environmental impacts of different strategies are dependent on your stocking rate. Um, you're not going to get the same outcome if you make a change to your stocking rate and then, uh, and then implement something. It's all going to be different. Actually, it's going to be on a, as it is for everything with serrated tussock, it's a farm by farm context, you know. Pasture perennially. Warwick was talking about the importance of perenni perenniality. 100% perennial pasture, 50-50. So if you've got 100% perennial pasture, you're going to have a, a, a positive greenhouse gas uh, impact. Uh, same with land use, you know. So the, uh, and what I want to do is actually try and line this up with, with the economics. Righto, so the environmental impacts of serrated tussock um, control strategies is dependent on, on the, um, the content of the perennial species. And if we could model something like coxfoot, um, as well as the natives or red grass that's more tolerant, then we'd see that species is probably going to have an impact as well. And then I was going to recap other points, but I won't. I'll move on. So this is where, you know, this is, I've just flashed up some graphs and all the rest of it. This is where I've been thinking, well, how is this relevant to you guys? How's it even relevant to <coughs> me? So I'm taking a step back, big picture, you know, and it's not as blue sky as it, as it actually, uh, it's not as blue sky as it, as it might seem. So one of the positives, this kind of work can feed into things like the domestic climate change policy. Domestic climate change policies. There's a carbon farming initiative where they actually credit farmers when they reduce their emissions. There's beef methodologies out there, and if you, if you participate in one of those and you can demonstrate that you're turning your animals off one month earlier, the, the, the government will give you money if you participate in the bidding and the auction and all the rest of it. And so I look at this and I say, well, in five years' time, what, what would I like to see in five years' time? What am I working towards? You know, what's my goal? <coughs> What I would like to see is that we can come up with some kind of whole farm management. If you've got a hill that's covered in tussie, controlling it, you're never going to get your money back, or maybe there's you know, the opportunity there to just let it go back to trees, fence it off. Don't even fence it off, let it go back to trees, get some money, you know, get some cash, because you will get cash. You can do that right now if you wanted to. Let's, you know, if you've got flats, and this is all on an individual context, um, if you've got more productive areas, put it down to crop fatten your lambs, get them off sooner, you know, and then you'll actually get money for doing that. What does all this mean? You know, it's, it's, it doesn't matter whose farm you go on to, you look at it, where's the tussock, what have they got, what are they running, all the rest of it. There's never ever going to be one recipe for tussock, for controlling tussock. It's going to be dependent on every single aspect of the, of the enterprise. Um, so, I don't know, you know, people may take nothing away from this, people may take different things away from this, you know, I can't sit here and say, well, this means that everybody should go and do all those kind of things. You, know, you, you, you need to recognise the diversity in the systems. And then I think, well, it's a win-win. If, if we can actually look at this long term, get these kind of things going, you know, and suddenly farms that people were, were probably thought were destined for rack and ruin actually become viable again and you know, it comes back to revitalising communities and you know, small farms might actually 
you know, not disappear because they just get amalgamated by the bigger guy. It's just those, those kind of things are what I hope the type of work that I'm doing are going to lead to, I suppose. That's how I'm trying to tie it all back to you guys. It took me a long time to think through this. And that's it. Uh, so I'll leave it at that, but I would like to, as Warwick had in there, I would like to thank the steering committee. Um, this has all been done in conjunction with weeds inspectors and some farmers and other bits and pieces. We've taken guidance from them. Um, it'll be interesting. We've got to, we still have to show the, la the final results, don't we, Warwick? So it'll be interesting to see, you know. I'll, I'll, I'll put this across people that are working on this stuff every day and, you know, that'll be the, uh, that'll be the truth, I suppose, whatever they tell me. Anyway, I'll leave it at that.